for the last 23 years, Professor Ward has modeled exactly that in BART studies. Uh, he is a BART specialist, and he is much, much more than that. On his website at the University of Oxford, uh, we see that his research interests include theology, philosophy, and cultural studies, along with the nature of religion and its relationship to anthropology, sociology, politics, gender theory, and contemporary science. And none of that is an exaggeration. If you look through the list of books he has published, there are eight listed on this website. The topics move from theology and philosophy of language to critical theory, to the politics of discipleship, to a book on the question of why we believe and why we don't. He is currently working on a three-volume systematic theology that is described as culturally engaged. We wouldn't expect anything less. Please join me in welcoming the Regius Professor of Theology at Oxford University, Graham Ward. Bruce, that's uh, really, really generous. Thank you. I'm going to take this off because it makes me feel like Paddington Bear. Um, <laughs> I really want to begin by uh, just thanking Paul and Kate. I've not been to Princeton uh, before, and, and in fact, the way I kind of use BART and think through BART, I never thought I would be invited <laughs> to Princeton. Uh, I, I, but actually being here has been a real delight and a real uh, blessing. I've had more sunshine over the last couple of days here than I'll probably get over a British summer. And um, I go back this afternoon into the English equivalent of Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> so what I want to talk, I'm sorry that, in fact, this, this, this was written two weeks ago, so I don't know what happened with, in my brain that I never gave Kate the title. <laughs> but it's, I would call it just simply Liberation Theology. Does Carbart have anything to offer here? And I'm aware that that um, title is deliberately provocative, and I'm interested in fact, provocation is what was um, being asked for. Um, it's provocative because Carbart and Liberation in the same title comes alongside a long standing distinction between systematic and public theology. RMDiv at uh, Oxford is actually entitled Applied Theology as if there was some kind of unbridgeable gulf between the theoretical and the practical theologically. What kind of an incarnationalism does that applied theology actually announce? What kind of incarnational gulf does that announce? So I assume now, and I've seen now, that in fact Paul and Kate actually did want some provo pro uh, provocation and that this, this event, as Bruce has said, is that partly what it was actually aiming for. The three concepts alongside theology that are going to preoccupy me most in this paper are context, culture, and experience. That is, the human experience of living in this context and inhabiting this culture. Now, none of these context, culture, experienced, none of them are static abstractions. They're dynamic, engaged, and engaging eventualizations, let's to use a Foucault term. In modern dogmatic theology, these engagements are sometimes viewed as at odds with the pursuit of the theologic determining the loci of Christian doctrine and its clarification. But I want to approach all three, context, culture, and experience, not in their abstraction, which tends to reduce the plurality to monolithic hypostases. But rather, I want to actually go through a very particular and even geographical situation, which for me, they clearly emerge, and emerge providentially. The turn to the particular and the material, to my mind, is a major characteristic of liberation theology and its attention to practice. So I'm going to proceed through this paper in three stages. First, clarifying 
a particular ongoing and evolving social context and culture that I'm going to treat. Second, saying something about the reception of Karl Barth's theology in that culture and in that context. And thirdly, sketching an inflection of Barth's theology in response to the liberation theology articulated within that context. That is, on the basis of the social conditions as they're engaged by Christians and non-Christians. Though Bart, I must say, is not necessary here, and I was glad that Paul actually mentioned that, there are other theologians and other theologics that may need less inflection to act as a response to liberation theology and that liberation theology is already working with. What I hope my analysis will do is open questions concerning the polemical and crisis character of liberation theology. Questions such as, is the prophetic voice occasional or a necessary and abiding aspect of doing theology? Can the adversarial nature of liberation theology handle complex and dynamic social, cultural, economic, and historical situations? Or must it inevitably oversimplify them to the point of rarefication, of capitalism, for example, of the poor, or even race? And perhaps more broadly, what is the relation of theology as a discursive practice to human flourishing? I'm going to be talking about liberation theology in its South African rather than its Latin American context. I live part of the year in South Africa, so I have some experience of the multi-leveled particularity of its context. The word context immediately presents itself here, understood as I said, as involving and comprising any number of social, political, economic, and cultural dynamics. There's nothing dialectical about context. These dynamics never exist in isolation. They issue from land, peoples, and languages. And with land, South Africa, we're dealing with complex histories of colonization and decolonizations, and also of rock, soil, climate, vegetation, animal life, and even rainfall. Context is ever expansive. Context is not a house that we live in. It's a force field in which we are actively situated. Liberation theology in South Africa grew out of black consciousness movement, and that shaped its emphases distinctively, as the Black Lives Matter campaign still does for liberation theology in South Africa today. Although in propaganda by the apartheid regime, such theology was often allied with Marxism, in the way liberation theology in Latin America drew attention to capital, labor, worker alienation, uh, and poverty from Marx, there's actually very little express expressive referral to Marx in liberation theology in South Africa, or even in the early forms of liberation theology to poverty. Race was much more central. And race isn't a monolithic entity here. It comprises of several distinct and overlapping ethnicities, from the Dutch to the San, from the Khoi to the Zulu. And a lot of interbreeding that began as far back as the Portuguese invasion itself. Black consciousness in South Africa owed much more to these various movements, some revolutionary, some conciliatory in America. Being white was explicitly associated with Eurocentrism, colonialism, and exploitive oppression. There was 
and there still is very little white consciousness in South Africa. Those South African churches and theologians supported and developed liberation theology in South Africa. Whites maintaining in general, it has to be admitted, their privileged position. Whiteness, the world over, seems to be very like the bureaucratic ideal of transparency. It has limited scope for reflect, reflecting upon the materialities of its own habitus and mediations. Apartheid may have been enshrined in segregation laws and states of emergency legislation, but its binary logics operated socially, culturally, and psychologically. As Dedman Tutu recalls, while the Anglican Church spoke of resistance to apartheid, unlike the Dutch Reformed Church until 1985, many white congregations were opposed to receiving Holy Communion alongside their domestic workers and paid a lower stipend to clergy according to race. This is Alan Buzak's definition of black consciousness. It is an awareness of black people that their humanity is constituted by their blackness, that black people are no longer ashamed that they are black, that they have a black history and a black culture distinct from the history and culture of Western white people, that blacks are determined to be judged no longer by and adhere no longer to white values. It is an attitude. It is a way of life. Bozak made that statement back in 1978 in his major work, Farewell to Innocence. So it's dated and itself is marked by the apartheid, dualistic ideology. Things may or they may not be different now, and the debate continues on that one. It is not either a theological statement explicitly, although the black consciousness in South Africa actually emerged in the university Christian movement of the late 60s, and returns again and again to the one book most South Africans, whatever their social status, have read and know well, the Bible. But I want to draw attention to aspects of Bozak's definition, that any theological examination of black consciousness would need to take on board. First, in tackling questions of race and more broadly ethnicity, theology would have to be concerned with how humanity is constituted and concerned then also with questions of color, gender, sexual orientation, class, and levels of physical ability. Secondly, such theology would have to be concerned with affect, bodily affect, in particular the constitution and transformation of emotional cultures. Shame rings out loud here. That is the internalization of certain cultural values or vilifications and social practices that install and ingrain them such that persons are supported in or denied ways to live. Thirdly, such a theology would need to articulate its relation to protest, to speaking prophetically about faith as it seeks understanding. It would have to be conscious of what it in itself was trying to do, what its purpose was with respect to those it was speaking to, and for the most part, speaking for. For black consciousness, as Bozak defines it here, is about judgment, being judged, and the social transformations that accrue from accepting that judgment. 
about the polemical insistence on justice and the exposure of injustice. And this brings sin into focus. Sin not as moral lapse or even flagrant disobedience, but rather as systemic violence in which the ability to choose is itself vitiated. The biblical basis for black consciousness also called into question white interests and ideologies informing biblical hermeneutics. Again, something whiteness and being Western had not and maybe still has not adequately reflected upon. For liberation theology, the practice of theology itself has a social and formative role with respect to reshaping a cultural ethos and a set of relational values. Apartheid was not only countenanced theologically, it was informed throughout with Western colonial values based in white supremacy that had prescribed ways in which sin, salvation, obedience, and ministry were all to be understood. But it shamed and dehumanized black and colored South Africans. It installed not just a reformed, colonial, missionizing Christianity. It inscribed white, male, heteronormative regimes and habits of mind on black bodies in the name of Christ. A Christian theology that speaks of healing, liberation, and reconciliation with respect to a covenant with God brought then emotional damage, systemic slavery, and violent social fracturing to a high percentage of a country's population. The white man thought he was Moses, when in fact he was Pharaoh, legitimating through a political theology, exploitation, sometimes in the name of mammon. The second stage of black theology, learning from liberation theologies in Latin America, added a more Marxist analysis of class and poverty. And poverty now is driving the theologies of liberation as I understand them. It has become more prominent as the quiet revolution of 1994-95 delivered power to the black people only for the majority of black people to discover that there are pharaohs on both sides of the Blood Red River. And that's the title of Alan Bozak's latest book. Being prophetic and polemical, liberation theology is affect-driven by shame, humiliation, dispossession, fear, and outrage, as religious conviction is always affect-driven. And it's fueled both by the engaged situatedness and the Bible. And there are tensions here. The Bible and the Protestant orthodoxy that informed both its reading and its status in the lives of the majority of South African people are white man's imports. Biblical theologies have to find new consonances within contextual situations. And the overwhelming human, black, and colored experience of alienation and oppression. Liberation theology is not a second order rational science, reflecting upon justification by God and the two natures of Christ. It's a first order effective practice. It's not applied theology. If there is no outworking of love or mercy or healing or setting free, then any secondary reflection is not only otios, 
its ideological utopianism. Such a theology participates, and that's a key word, it participates in redemption. It doesn't just talk about it forensically. It lifts Marx's call for the transformation rather than just the interpretation of the world to levels where doxology might emerge in, through, and beyond <coughs> oppression, poverty, and institutional violence. And this is important because it counters some of the criticisms from Christian theologians wary of using Marx, conflating his revolutionary socialism with a critical tool for making the relationship between class and capitalism visible. It also counters the criticism that liberation theology is liberal humanism before its theology, what uh, Barth would call Prometheanism. Black liberation theology was Bible-based, spirit-led, and Christ-centered. If it didn't go in for the niceties of theologic concerning Trinitarian relations, it didn't either collapse the Trinity into social relations on a ground that would not be biblical. And the Bible doesn't go in for the niceties of Trinitarian exposition either. The focus of this liberation theology was certainly God ad extra, God as liberator and redeemer, but it issues from God in God's self as triune. As liberation theology was gathering pace in apartheid South Africa, the theology of Karl Barth played second violin to Bonhoeffer's lead. And it's important to understand why. It was not simply that Bonhoeffer's active involvement in resistance to national socialism offered a model for Christian activism, though it did. It was not that Bonhoeffer's theological reflections throughout his time of imprisonment offered an inspirational resource for the theologians, black and white, who had themselves been imprisoned, or knew people who were imprisoned, or lived under the continual threat of being imprisoned, though they were. It was also Bonhoeffer's theology provided a much more explicit understanding of the relationship between theological dogmatics and social ethics. The relationship between dogmatics and ethics in Barth's theology was much more contested, and always has been. And it sounds from what I'm hearing throughout this conference, it still is, despite the work of scholars like Marquit, Golvitzer, and Huntsinger. This is, of course, not to say that Barth was uninterested in social and political conditions, and the conditions under which and in which he lived. He certainly was, explicitly so, in his early work, to which many of the early South African theologians referred. But his reform theology was used by the conservative wing of the reformed church in South Africa, not to validate apartheid, it didn't do that, but to validate a certain political pietism that strengthened the status quo and viewed activism as revolutionary socialism. Barth himself, having rejected any belief in liberal immanentism from his 1919 Tambach lecture onwards, could embrace his socialist tendencies even in the final part of the church dogmatics, but under the aegis of God's preferential option for the poor in Jesus Christ. All action had to be divinely governed, divinely ordered, and divinely inspired. Human beings recognized and responded obediently. This was the basis for ethical life, not activism. One might say, and I'll return to this, Bart certainly had a theology of action. But unlike someone like Maurice Blondel, 
Eri Shavara. It was only a divine action, a Christology in which human beings might be recipients, but not co-respondents of grace, governed by any association with human action. The miracles were paradigms of God's grace. They happened to us in our various poverties and subjections. Nevertheless, eight years prior to the capitulation of the apartheid regime and 16 years after the Sharpeville massacre that became the clarion call for political change, a book appeared, edited by Charles Villavicencio, on reading Karl Barth in South Africa. To my mind, it didn't change much. Today, Bonhoeffer is still the most widely regarded white theologian in South Africa. But it attempted to provide Protestant theologians in South Africa with a resource for reflection that while working with liberation theology, attempted to ground its humanitarian agenda within a Christological framework. It was an effort to reclaim the reformed Christian heritage for the oppressed. Now, whatever secret deals were made that made the transition from apartheid tyranny to republic, de, Republican democracy in South Africa possible, and there were secret deals. The anticipated bloodbath of revolution didn't occur. Rather, theological, theologically, the transit marked what Martin Luther King Jr. defined as the revolution of values. And the key concept of this revolution was reconciliation. And it's exactly at this point that a political situation touches upon an axiomatic concern in Barth's theology. For the doctrine of reconciliation bears all the weight of redemption and indeed the gospel for Barth. If then we are to offer some answer to what Barth's theology might offer liberation theology, then it's here that the investigation might begin. The TRC was set up immediately following Mandela becoming president in the new South Africa, with Desmond Tutu heading it up. Not only does the name and the mandate of the committee reflect key concerns in the Christian gospel, a former Anglican uh, archbishop and a Christian theologian is charged with overseeing its proceedings. The commission from the beginning, uh, from beginning to end, was both lauded and critiqued, with some liberal theologians, like Alan, liberation theologians like Alan Berzak, convinced it betrayed its roots in the Christian tradition. What is of interest to me was that the word reconciliation is being pulled in several different directions, and it still is because of the debate's going on right now in South Africa. Religiously, with respect to the other faiths practiced in South Africa, and politically, with respect to the liberal secular agenda. It's a highly contested term, freighted with different expectations and hopes from a multitude of perspectives. Theologically, redemption in terms of liberation from oppression floundered as the situation revealed itself. It operated on a belief vindicated in part in the therapeutics of storytelling with some but very limited reparations for violation of human rights and the granting of amnesties to certain perpetrators of those violations who, to use a kind of theological language, confessed their sins. Truth-telling led to a certain civic restitution for all sides in the conflict impartially. Nevertheless, if this situation is taken as a case study, then it highlights a fundamental theological tension at the heart of liberation theology. And a question about the task of theology with the respect to the salvation it professes and reflects upon. If the aim of its revolution 
is social justice and the enfranchisement of all from the forces of dehumanization, then it has to look beyond the oppressive situation to the restitution of order. Justice is not established by reconciliation. Rather, justice has to emerge from reconciliation. But civic reconciliation, like civic justice, is not the same and cannot be the same as Christian reconciliation and justice. If they were the same, then one form of political hegemony gets replaced by another. In South Africa's case, apartheid racist tyranny by a Christian political theology. And both hegemonies are not simply cultural, they are institutional. They have to be or have to become institutionalized if they're to be established. As we'll see in my inflections of Bartian theology, they are not. But in a religiously pluralist nation state in which agnosticism, secular humanism, and atheism have to be respected, Christian orthopraxis and Christian orthodoxy cannot be imposed. They have to negotiate their perspective alongside other perspectives that do not share or accept the gospel and notions of redemption in and through Christ on which they're based. To make this tension in liberation theology more apparent, let's venture into Barth's doctrine of the Sonog, where conciliation and atonement are identical. I'm taking up his discussion in sections 57 and 58 of the Church Dogmatics, where he establishes the theological axioms of his exposition. Fundamental is reconciliation, to reconciliation is a sovereign act of God in Christ and as Christ. And this is worked out in brief through a commentary on John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But towards the end of the commentary, he links that verse to the Pauline text of 2 Corinthians 5.19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses onto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. His emphasis is, all is grace, and this is Bart, we can only be recipients. On this basis, there's a tension between systematic and liberation theology. How to develop a theology of liberation in both senses of that genitive that is also a systematic theology, or a systematic theology that is also determinatively a political theology. And I say determinatively because we can extract from a systematic theology certain assumptions or even statements that are political or have political ramifications, like Bart's reflections on work, for example, in CD section 55 on active life. But in a systematic theology that is determinatively a theology of liberation, then those politics of discipleship need fleshing out in terms of examining the relationship between ecclesiology, missiology, pneumatology, and the dynamic multi-leveled context. We might put it this way. Liberation theology is rooted in the discernment of crisis, and that is the poor and the destitute in their grieving and oppression, who reveal and announce that crisis. The crisis is recognized as a kairos moment of inbreaking divine judgment and the church, to be the church in this moment, must be a prophetic church, 
joining protest with perhaps civil disobedience. It receives in this crisis the understanding that the times are out of joint for the inbreaking of Kairos, God's time, reveals what should be beyond what is. What is, is apocalyptic, pessimism, nihilism. What should be is eschatological. In South Africa, this eschatological uh, vision is envisaged in a community, a nation, a, dem a democratic sitzve in Gorsa. That is non-racial, non-sexist, participatory. How can this prophetic church, its active involvement in overthrowing oppression and exposing systemic violence also be the church of the atonement, the minister of the sonung, and the word of reconciliation? How can this church resist the placations and opiates of theological placebos? This can't be ecclesiologies, missiologies, and pneumatologies in abstracto. It has to be theological doctrine that's lived out, that takes human experience as it is and articulates, and in that articulation attempts to perform a revolution of values in and through the name of Christ. The systematic theology has to be one with a political theology. They have to participate in the same theologic. The political lies not in inferences drawn from doctrine, but rather doctrine that is itself transformative in the way it is articulated, promulgated, and lived. The prophetic call to repentance and entering, sorry, the prophetic call is a call to repentance and entering into the crisis liberation theology proclaims. A repentance that some, including Tutu, saw absent or at least not self-evident in the amnesties offered and given in the procedures of the TRC. But and here's my point. The prophetic is not then a moment in Christian theology. It is a mode of political, sorry, of polemical engagement. It is not a locus in systematic theology. The transformations involved in metanoia are ongoing and throughout all of its reflections. For Gregory of Nyssa, they are eternal because caught up in the divine operation going from glory to glory towards an endless doxology. Conversion to Christ is the work of the word, the logos within us, caught up in the dynamics of providence and formation, pedagogy and sanctification. Sanctification is the endless reception of imputed justification. It is the eternal operation of God, not an event. We are time-bound creatures, employing time-bound language tied to specific cultures, lands, and civilizations. If we conceive conversion as a beginning and origin, we have to understand grace is without beginning and origin of faith and participation. It is God in God's self, given in an eternal Trinitarian condition as love and mercy and justice, and as in the flourishing of right and true relations. The call of liberation is written into creation itself as the call not just to receive passively, that is, bear witness, but to receive actively, that is, to testify as doxological response. 
As we've come to understand in the biology of emotion and the organics of sentience, reception and response are not dialectical opposites. They're two integrated aspects of an ecology of relations whereby all biotic things flourish, including us. Cause and effect are not temporally distinct, but part of feedback and feed-forward loops in the teleonomy of life, circular, not linear. So I throw this out. Bart's attention is to the gift of grace, and we owe him for that one. And while recognizing this constitutes Christian experience, unfortunately is far less detailed is on, on his account of the reception of grace. Perhaps because the reception of grace for Christianity has to begin, I'm so, so thankful for Faye here, uh, this was written before hers, but I'm so thankful for her for doing this. It has to begin with an examination of Mary, something Bart conceives worryingly as deeply Roman and therefore deeply problematic. And while in his elaboration of the principles for reconciliation, I agree with him that the Roman account of grace issuing from the Marian theology articulated by Pius XII's encyclical, Munificentimus, it's just a, such a difficult word to say. I should get uh, Oliver to say it for me. Deus. I, while I agree that in that encyclical is over uh, schematic and scholastic, Bart cannot hear beyond the polemics of his Protestantism versus his Catholicism. Maybe more generously, even the distinctions made in that encyclical be between grata, externa, priveniens, operans, sufficiens, interna, habitualis, efficax, effic what is being registered in those distinctions are different tonalities of grace tonalities that get registered in the reception of grace. To consider the role of Mary is to engage in a theological account of reception. The Archimedean point is justification by faith. And here I find an irresolvable crux between the Christological imputation of faith and the analogia fidei in Bart that it enables. The analogia is just not sufficiently analogical for me. However radical the difference between the analogate and the analogon, between the uncreated creator and created kind, there's a smidgen of similarity upon which a theology of participation has to rest. And the gravity and the theology of that smidgen rests upon the incarnation itself. Because it's there that there is a divine accommodation to our creaturely reality. Because there's an accommodation to our human flesh in Jesus Christ. Faith is, for me, not only imputed, extrinsic, and therefore passive obedience. It is also intrinsic, and therefore active entrustment. And this is summed up in Mary's fiat. Let it be to me. A human echo of the divine fiat which calls creation out of nothing. Let there be light. We walk in the invisibility of God's grace into clouds of unknowing, but that grace is not in opposition to, the nat to nature, but an entry into seeing the natural differently, as given, as created, as an act of liberal and liberating generosity, given active testimony in doxological response. Faith as relinquishment is lived actively, lived in Christ as our lives are hidden 
in Christ. Creaturely lives, whether saint or sinner, it works way beyond the epistemological. Its pedagogy is affective, engendering a vulnerability that makes suffering and injustice just downright painful, intolerable. The gravel in the heart is turned to sentient flesh. Only then can there be identification and solidarity that exposes cheap, self-rewarding charity and all the masquerades of paternalism. We suffer with, and that's active, not passive. What the relinquishment of faith reveals to us is the depths of our poverties and the very embarrassment of our riches. We discover, maybe, something of one's common fragility. Then reconciliation is possible and restitution is possible. Then relinquishment is lived as social justice and healing. Action activism has necessary to follow while we abide in the continual sense of our inadequacy. The activity is a demand of the practice of hope in the face and beyond the face of our own inadequacy. As I said, Bart's Christological reading of reconciliation, he moves from an exegesis of John 3.16 to an exegesis of 2 Corinthians 5.19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses onto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. But in Bart's exegesis, something is not observed, which for me is crucial if dogmatics is also social ethics. It's that last phrase, hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Bart rightly understands the evangelical commission here, but he fails to hear the scriptural text beyond his own Protestantism, it seems to me. And two points are salient for a more comprehensive and thicker reading of that text. First, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But what is translated as not imputing is the present participle, me lugzemenos which is balanced in the next clause by the present particle, themenos. The deponent verb, legizomai, is from logos. The subject here is Christ as the logos. In other words, there's a phonetic and semantic play in this text in which the work of Christ is countering the reasons and calculations of sin that we might be Themenos, that is, placed, set elsewhere. Themenos is an action with respect to taking up a position or occupying a certain condition. In this case, a new position and a new condition. It's the participle of the complex irregular verb tithomai. Secondly, what this new condition or situation brings about in us is our involvement in logos, ten kaleges, the Christic work of reconciliation. The work of the logos with respect to the reconciliation of the world operates in and through we who are placed within that operation. That we who are in Christ might work in him for that self-same re reconciliation. We who are reconciled must now reconcile. What I'm doing here, and I'm drawing to a close, um, what I'm doing here is drawing out 
the effective pedagogy of faith as grace received and grace experienced. Without that reception, there can be no account of grace or faith at all. God would simply give to God in and through God, and God could not be God for us. And that's fundamental for Bach. What I'm also drawing out is that the new human being in Christ is the human being created in and through the Logos. Creation, not just a Christology founded upon the historical incarnation, pertains to salvation as reconciliation. Christology and creation cannot be divorced ontologically. The point of real difference here is both Christological and ontological. Bart states boldly, Christians exist in him. But I want to say all creaturely reality exists in and through him. Setting aside questions about the extent to which other creatures possess their own forms of consciousness, human beings as rational creatures think, plan, and give an account of. Logids amenos. But the logos is the key to salvific thinking, planning, and giving account of. God's giving of God's self in the triune redemptive work of Christ and the Spirit turns our creative, created ability and sinful ability to rationalize. To rationalize that is not just cognitive but effective and corporeal, it translates that into a conscious participation in the Logos. We are always in Christ, as all things exist in Christ. That is why not just human, but cosmic reconciliation is possible. To wit, Paul's redemption of the body of creation itself. To sum up, Bart's inadequate attention, I think, to the Greek of 2 Corinthians 5.19 brought about a certain theological closure in terms of justification by faith because it misses something fundamental about how grace can be received and what that great reception enables, not just for us, but in us. Or does it? Because this point that I've just drawn attention, attention to is ambivalent in Bart. And this is what screws me up about Bart so much. There's so much you want to agree with and then so much you just find. You know, I was saying to someone earlier on, sometimes I read Bart and I think, this is not a God I worship. And other times I think, my goodness, really, that's so insightful. Having emphasized that not only Christians exist in Christ, Bart then goes on to add, it is not only that they, non-Christians, lack Jesus Christ and in him the being of man reconciled to God. What they lack is the obedience to his Holy Spirit. Now I find that couple of sentences, trying to think through, complex theologically. Maybe it's the separation of the ontological from the noetic that the distinction between Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit seems to point to, a, 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 that Bart develops later in part four. There's something speculative, even modalist, about such a distinction. And existentially, it has no purchase at all. Maybe it's just the imposition, the, the imprecision of that negative, nicht felt. Either way, whatever the amb ambiguity is, they don't need addressing for such a theology that I want to pursue. I note them, though, because I also want to try and be balanced. What this means is that our redemption in Christ is and always will be partial until all things are reconciled, until the work of divine grace brings all things to rest at the feet of Christ and situated, themenos again, with respect to him. Until, that is, all things are liberated. 
And in the effective pedagogy of God's grace, the liberty we are brought into works with God's own freedom to act to bring about the liberation of all creation. To conclude, there are some in South Africa who feel they need to return to their Kairos document because liberation theology there stalled in the quiet revolution that took place in the aftermath at the end of apartheid. And that raises the question of the future of liberation theology. We might view this as a hiatus rather than a lapse, a refocusing in the light of dramatic and significant changes to the governance of that country. Because liberation theology can never come to the end, to an end. That's the whole point about we are still only partially redeemed. There's a complexity there that I can go into. Alan Verzak called for faithful resistance. And that faithful resistance must continue while any single person remains unliberated while any single person still suffers under oppressive deprivations until Christ and the kingdom are fully established, whatever that might mean, and however that might look, that none of us actually know. For all that, we need a theological vision in which the, the determinations of Christian doctrine in form, in a very strong sense of that word, in form and are informed by social and political ethics that are lived and are to be lived. In South Africa, I wonder whether Christian theology needs to step back. It's been so infused with colonialism and mission as colonialism that there's a need to decolonize Christian theology to seek the triune God who has always been there in Africa. And the Christ who is incarnate God is both transhistorical and transnational. They do not need more Western depictions of a Mediterranean Jesus. And I'm not saying that the, the theology of Karl Barth can't help inspire, but his theology, like mine, is white and Western, rooted in context, culture, and experience that is not South African except by importation. It needs a gospel that is not freighted with a heathenism that needs converting to Western civilized ideals. South Africa needs to continue nurturing its own theologians rooted in their land, their histories, their cultures, magnificently plural, in a way that Bart is and was within his. Thank you.